Welcome back to the Effortless Swimming Podcast. My guest for part two of this podcast is Sam Fenton. Sam, welcome back. Thank you. So in the first episode, we talked about um, like the high performance model and, and a way to basically keep people who, who start sport at a young age, how to keep them in that sport for longer and how to have them. It's almost like having a better attitude, to, attitude towards fitness and health later on in life and having them to continue that healthy, active lifestyle instead of the, the churn and burn kind of model. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so big change. Yeah. Now from to a physical, what we call a physical literacy model. So huge in Canada, they've, they've institutionalized physical literacy right throughout the entire country. Um, you know, and, and big in a lot of other countries. Um, but Australia, we're just getting on board now with it. So sport Australia is getting right behind it. Uh, now that sport is under DHHS as well. So now sport and health, um, are linked together by funding and politics, I guess. So um, it's a really big thing in Australia now. It'll be rolling out over the next few years and getting into the school curriculum. And that's that's where I'm doing my PhD studies in that that space of getting schools to do that stuff. And so if you haven't uh, heard that episode, that was part one of uh, the podcast series with Sam. And today we're talking about something that I think 99% of, our, uh, of, of the listeners will be interested in. And that's talking about feet and ankles and how you can go from having an anchor at the end of your, at your legs to a, a propeller. And uh, I know from experience working with a lot of adult swimmers and triathletes that ankle mobility or flexibility is a real issue for them. And yeah. more times than not, um, their feet are slowing them down rather than assisting them. So we're going to look at today a couple of things that will help, help you improve your, I guess, range of motion with your feet. Uh, even if you think that it's just done for, if you can't get that any better than where you currently are. We're also going to look at um, how well, some exercises as well that's going to help you basically just become a, a better kicker. And I'm really interested in some of the things you've got to to say because you've studied this in depth. And yeah. I'd say I'm, I know a little bit about it, but nowhere near as much as you. So let's uh, let's get into it. Okay. All right. So um, you'll just have to allow the the screen sharing thing so I can pop that up here. But just um, there'll be people listening that won't have any visual as well, I guess. But um, I guess this was um, a research project I did for my master's uh, as part of a master in high performance sport. And, um, and I wanted to, uh, I was fascinated by research that had been done by a huge uh, team by Dr. Rajat Mittal uh, and, a, and a guy called Frank Fish, which is a pretty apt name, um, <laughs> and, a, and a huge team of researchers and a big bucket of money by the US Navy. Um, to put together supercomputers and a and a and a huge system to um, to analyze every particle of water um, and every particle of a dolphin to to figure out what was the most efficient way to move through the water. Um, obviously, with the the end goal for the U.S. Navy was a, a submarine that can't be to, can't be detected, um, but then. After that research, uh, that they you know, they broke down every molecule of water, every molecule of the dolphin, how it moves through the water, and all of that sort of stuff, um, and how efficiently it moves through the water. They uh, they had all of this gear, they had this research team, and they had nothing else to do after this project finished. So, um, so Dr. Rajat Middle rang up the U.S. swim team, and um, this was when uh, Michael Phelps was at his peak, and they tested the top fifty swimmers and did exactly the same research on them. Uh, the outcome of that was that Michael Phelps uh, was the closest person um, from that from those fifty swimmers to to swim in to emulate the movement of the dolphin. Um, but particularly uh, of particular interest, what was happening um, was the propulsion that was coming from his feet. Uh, as we know, as a lot of people might know, he has rather large feet. Uh, but it, it was how he used those um, feet to propel through the water that was uh, of particular interest. Um, have you allowed the, yeah, you'd be able to bring it, bring up this screen just, share. Uh, yep. So, and, bring up and so screen. people who are listening to this, um, on our, you know, on iTunes or on Spotify, um, Sam's sharing a video, so we'll make it as, as good as we can if you can't see the video, but, uh, you can also find this on our YouTube channel, which is the effortless swimming YouTube channel, which you'll be able to find if you just look it up on Google. Yeah. Okay. So for me as a strength and conditioning coach for swimming, the interest for me was the extra efficiency and speed that you get from the underwater dolphin kick, which is why we've seen, uh, you know, everyone exploit that 15 meters either end of the pool um, in competitive swimming. 
Um, so, and the reason for that is the reduced drag, the reduced energy expenditure, and the slightly higher speed. And the ho slightly ho higher speed comes from holding the speed that you get from the push off the ball or the dive um, that you get to start. So, um, when you hit the top of the water, then you've got surface drag. Um, <clears throat> and you increase in, in energy expenditure. So, so you might swim um, at the same, close to the same speed, but um, you're using heaps more energy. And I think for the triathletes out there and those just trying to learn how to swim faster or not be slowed down by their legs or be slowed down by their feet, this is where it starts to get important, this information. So, so the basic um, sort of four sort of quadrants of, of research uh, that we didn't know about that was out there already um, was the the von der Boek one it was the uh, the underwater uh, the dolphin studies uh, that was done then on the US swim team uh, increase in increase of dorsiflexion strength and internal rotation strength uh, both from the same study that's what really interested me because there was nothing like that out there and everything that I'd read um, and everything that I'd asked swim coaches ahead of doing this study was that pliability of the ankle or flexibility of the ankle was what was most important. So what this study was suggesting, which was new to me and, and I think new to the swimming world, which is why I wanted to do the research, um, was that there was a huge uh, strength component. And um, there was another um, Japanese study that was done that showed uh, five degrees of extra plantar flexion in a computer model increased speed and efficiency. So I think for anyone watching out there, I think that's probably one of the key things is that um, a small increase in flexibility um, and an increase in strength through your feet uh, can make a, a big difference. Now, what I did was put that together in a study and um, I, I'll just skip to the next slide there. So what I did was put that into a study looking at the range and strength. So, uh, so I chose uh, a couple of swim teams where I knew I could get really good coaches, MLC, where, where you're uh, currently been doing a bit of work, Brent, and, uh, and Nana Wadding Swim Club. And I had a couple of coaches there help me out. And I had um, Andrew, um, oh, Andy, Andy, Andy Cameron um, do, the, do the actual uh, physical dynamometer test to test the strength of the feet and the flexibility of the feet um, and what I came up with uh, out of my study was just a, a good protocol which is just a 20 25 meter underwater swim um, and looked at whether strength and range was uh, were factors but we put everything else through you know we put everything else through the mill as well everything that you would expect so all of the upper body range the their streamline range um, you know, and, and I had lots of swim coaches telling me what's important in the underwater dolphin kick. Um, some say it's the hips, some say it's the upper body, some say it's, you know, um, natural talent. You know, people have lots of different reasons for performance. Um, and what came out of this study, we put it all through a, um, a statistical analysis. And what came out was that 30% um, of the performance was explained by the um, range and flexibility put together, which is which is what I expected from the previous studies that have been done, but it hadn't been done before in a in a, in a practical um, competitive setting with with age group swimmers. Do you mean um, do you mean strength and flexibility, or range and flexibility it's the combination? Yeah, it's yeah, the sorry, combination yeah. together. Yeah, so, so strength and flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the statistical with the statistical modelling that we did, um, every every bit of uh, data that we gathered um, goes through and then the, the, the um, regression analysis spits out a couple of models that, that showed the biggest improvement. And so the model that came out with the biggest improvement was a, was a mixture of the range and strength, um, which again, I expected from computer modeling, but again, we hadn't seen, seen it in a practical setting um, and it showed up showing that, you know, it was responsible for 30% of the performance. So, um, so it's a really, really big factor. And I guess um, maybe I'm skipping ahead, but I guess the big question for a lot of a lot of people will be thinking now is, all right, that's that sounds great. How do I now improve those two things? Yep, and uh, that's what every swim coach said straight away when they saw me doing the study. As soon as they saw um, Andrew, you know, with a dynamometer doing the doing the testing and me me sitting there with my spreadsheet and those sort of things, <laughs> um, they were they were like, oh, does that make a difference? Uh, and I said, well, that's a hypothesis. I think it does. 
And, um, and they're like, well, what do I have to do? What exercises? And they're like, oh, well, do I do ballet exercises? You know, things like, you know, the, um, all those foot movements and foot stretching and foot strengthening. Uh, and the answer is actually yes. Um, so those, you know, stronger feet, smarter feet uh, are really, really important. Um, a really, there's some other really interesting studies that I haven't spoken about where that they did do on age group swimmers where they, they showed that um, skilled age group swimmers who were skilled in the underwater dolphin kick were grabbing vortices that came off their knees because, because humans are, are clunky. We've got all these joints. Dolphins are smooth and they, you know, and they, they move like a, you know, they've got a right down to the end. It's a, it's a wave that goes through their body that generates the propulsion. But because humans have hips and knees and ankles, there's, there's the, all of those places there, those segments of the body that create lots of friction in the water or vortices in the water. But what they showed was that the, the skilled swimmers were actually grabbing the vortices that were going in the opposite direction coming off the knees and then, then grabbing those vortices and turning them into a jet stream aimed in, in precisely the right direction. So... Hmm. Um, so what we know is that there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more to the story, um, that it's not just flexibility, it's strength and skill. And, and what I believe, and, and, and this is you know, a lot of research down the track that needs to be done, but there's, there's a huge element of proprioception here of getting that feedback to motor control loop um, and being able to and feeling it on your skin, and I know this from you know working with swimmers that work at a really really high level of skill that teach me a lot about strength and conditioning, um, is that they have such a feel and they can feel the water on their skin and they adjust to that, and that's why they learn how to propel themselves through the water and they learn to avoid resistance, um, and they also can feel that through their feet. And and what um, what we know now that skilled swimmers are doing is they're actually grabbing vortices. They're finding um, areas of water that are moving in the opposite direction, grabbing them with their feet, turning them into a jet, jet stream and creating propulsion, which is amazing. It's amazing just to yeah. know that that's happening. Um, how do they, you know, it's, it, it boggles the mind in, in terms of how much um, neural power or brain power or, you know, f- you know uh, utilising that proprioceptive feedback loop that it would take to actually understand what's going on, let alone understand it and turn that into uh, moving really, really fast through the water. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so for a, a long story short, the key, the key, I mean, there's, there's several keys to this, but around the feet, the feet are super, super important in performance. They either speed you up or they slow you down. Um, and you need to have strong feet, smart feet, uh, and the right amount of flexibility. So uh, if your feet are just floppy, um, then that doesn't necessarily help. Um, and thinking from a, a lot of the triathletes I work with, uh, particularly if they've come from a running background, very stiff ankles and, yep. um, and often quite limited. What, uh, what could those athletes do to over time Im- improve it? And we know that we don't want to, you're know, talking about this last time is we don't want to just, uh, sit on the feet and, and stretch, you're talking the ligaments cause it's, it's not great for them. So what yep. can that, what can they do to just gradually improve it? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, the thing is what we're talking about going back to that 5% study, um, that was done through computer modeling and Japanese study, um, a, a little, a little bit of extra, um, range makes, makes a big difference. Um, and it's probably better to say things like range and mobility than flexibility, because when you say flexibility, people think, oh, well, if I just jump on my feet and rock backwards on them, then that's going to, then they're going to be more flexible. And yes, they will be more flexible, but you might cause a lot of damage, particularly if you have stiff feet um, to start with. So you might just be tearing at the ligaments of your feet. And once you've, you know, once you've um, stretched the ligaments, you've created instability, um, you've created a, probably a much worse situation uh, than you started with. This is, and this is the, um, this is the juxtaposition of, of things that you need from a human performance perspective um, for triathletes, because running on land, um, you increase performance through stiffness um, and then running on water, uh, running on water, swimming through, <laughs> sorry, you improve your performance through, um, through your mobility and skilled um, and, 
creating a skilled wave movement through your body. So, mm. um, so that's, so that's the big challenge. So it's, it's mobility stuff. So the more, the more you can do with, um, conditioning your tendons. So that, that means rolling from, so with a foam roller or a tennis ball or, you know, um, a myofascial ball of some description or a myofascial roller is rolling from your knees um, all the way down. So the connective tissue goes, you know, it goes up through your feet. You've got all of these uh, like strings that go from your toes right up through um, your shins, connect around sheaths um, around your, the tibialis anterior or your big shin muscle um, and, and all of your other muscles around your feet. Um, or add, which is also an internal rotator, which is also, um, is a big part of how you internally rotate your feet, which is a big mm. part of how you hold, hold your feet to create propulsion in the water as well. So, so you need to do control work where you're controlling what your feet are doing. So really simple stuff. Um, so with, with our swimmers, what we do is just circles in circles out and pull up as hard as you can and push down as hard as you can. So if you do that, we, so are you able to pull down this, this share screen? Cause I reckon, I don't know if yeah. I'm recording this, um, it, it might not get you um, showing that motion. So, okay. So yeah. just, just showing it with my hands. So, so if you're, um, so doing circles out with your feet and, and you're, and you're creating as much dexterity as you can through to your toes. So you try right through your foot. Say that's the back of your foot. You're trying to bend your foot backwards. You're trying to rotate right up, right out, around, push down as hard as you can and push up. Now for our stiff footed friends, um, they're going to start cramping probably within about 10 reps. All right. So, so if you're pulling up as hard as you can, pushing to the side as hard as you can pu and pushing down as hard as you can. But what you're actually doing is because, because all of those tendons, um, are running through your feet, running through the bones, you're starting to free, free them up and you're starting to push and pull and push and pull them through a range that they, may, they might not have ever uh, gone through. So, so you're starting to open them up and starting to get them moving. You're making your feet smarter. You're getting your feet and you, you're watching them too. So you're getting a sense of your feet, becoming more aware of your feet. So you're connecting um, visual neurons to motor neurons to receptors that you get when you get pain. And if you have sore muscles the next day, you have more receptors as well. So, you, so you're building up more and more skill, more and more um, uh, receptors um, and, and um, motor neurons, receptor neurons that uh, can, can develop that whole feedback loop that's going to make your kick a lot better. Um, and, and it's really, really important because huh. if you think about doing a long, uh, a long swim, as part of uh, as part of an overall triathlon, um, you don't want your feet slowing you down and making you work harder and wasting energy that you could be using at the end of your race. So it's really really important. And in terms of the rolling, so you're talking about rolling out like through through the front part of your your leg, like your shin, and even on the side a little bit by the sounds of it, like through yep. there. Yep. And what about the do the calves count as well? Is that going to help, or is it more just on the front? Yep. So um, so. Yeah, there wouldn't be um, in terms of plantar flexion. So, so pushing your foot down. Um, so, so this is the top of your foot. So when so when you kick on the water, and this and this is just as much for freestyle kick out in the surf as it is for underwater dolphin kick. Um, you want to create this surface here where you're pushing back and 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 projecting on the water. Um, there's more to it there. There's actually a sculling action involved as well, which is using the Bernoulli principle, which is a whole nother thing to get into, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's really, really important that you roll everything from the knee all the way down to the end of the toes, um, mm. to condition the fascia and, and fascia takes a long time to condition a long, long time. So that's why it's important that you take your feet through those range. You actively take them through that range. It's not a passive, um, stretch. Um, again, which is why just sitting on your feet and rocking back is not such a great idea really for, really for anyone. That's not something that I've ever encouraged. I always see it and swimmers keep yeah. doing it all the time. And, and look, I've recommended it before as well. Um, so it's good to have, um, it's good to have a few different ways to improve it. So th that's looked at, uh, at the, the range of motion and now what do you do in terms of strength? Yeah. So just, just with a, a band, um, I've actually, I've put up a YouTube video of, of Ruby, um, doing this. Um, yeah, yep. as part of the study as well. Um, but yeah, just, just again, just 
pushing down, which is, you know, plantar flexion pushing down with a, with a uh, band, you know, like a ribbon band around your feet. So pushing down as hard as you can, pulling up as hard as you can, um, and turning in and turning out. So, um, and have you got the band around your feet the whole time as you do that? Yeah. 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 That's right. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, just like a fair, a, a ribbon fit theraband, it, like a similar one that you'd use for your shoulder, shoulder rotation, the internal and external rotations and stuff like that as well. Yeah. Same, same deal. Thing. Um, you yeah. can put a link, you can put a link to the video in your, um, in your feed down the bottom. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it's just pushing down, pulling up and being able to create that circle against, against resistance to strengthen the muscles. Like I said, with no band, mm. just, just doing those movements, pushing down, pulling up and doing circles outwards and doing circles inwards. If you do 50 reps, each of those, um, that's a couple of hundred reps right there. Um, you'll be conditioned and you'll be improving mm. your condition. And like I said, for our stiff footed friends, that's, you know, they, they're going to start, the muscles will start burning after about you know, 10 reps or so if they're pushing. Yeah. I oh, look so many like, I had clinics on the weekend and um, yeah, quite a few people said they cramp all the time. They cramp in their, um, in their feet, they cramp in their calves. And, um, and so that stuff's obviously going to help. Is there anything else that would help them avoid uh, cramping there? And like, I think a lot of times that it seems like it's just stiffness through the feet and through the, through the calves and just through the entire leg from all the running and riding and stuff. But um, what other things would you suggest that they do there? Yeah. Um, it's not just, yeah, look, it's, it's, con- it's lack of conditioning through those muscles too. So, right. Um, as, as, as you would know, and you would have experienced as well. Um, if, um, you know, when you get back in the pool after a long time and, and you're, and you're getting cramps, it's, it's, it's in those muscles that are the least conditioned. That's, mm. that's where you start cramping. So, um, yeah, look, the huge issue with feet, um, and I don't want to get controversial here, um do it um, get controversial (laughs) uh yeah look if if but i think it makes sense if you think of strapping your foot down in a in a moon boot in uh in one of those boots if you've ever had a broken foot or an ankle or whatever it is uh, you strap your feet down and what happens to your feet i'm not sure i've never uh well they just don't get used so i guess they uh uh some of the muscles waste away and probably lose well you lose conditioning yeah so you lose conditioning you lose control you lose strength um and you lose muscle now unless you do something to gain that muscle back um you're you know you're permanently um a little bit less able uh to do something right because you have less muscle or less and less strength uh your physiology has changed now if you strap your foot down into a shoe now you, and this this goes for bike shoes so um ski boots snowboard boots um any type of shoe that you strap your foot down really really hard into um you you've basically strapped your foot down into a moon boot so then what you're relying on is everything above above that um part of the chain Mm. um to to do all the work and then all of a sudden you're you're doing something that requires a lot of work um, from muscles that are used to being you know fixed fixed down and laced down or you know, if you crank your um, shoes up in your on your bike as well, so uh, and there's no movement allowed in in all of those situations. So we've got it. We've got a, a pretty strong culture of strapping down our feet um, and 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 really anaesthetizing them and not and not um, not appreciating them. I think so. Um, but there was you know the whole barefoot movement and the class action against the Vibram Five Fingers as well. <laughs> yeah. um, but the but the answer to that is that. Um, you can't get expi- inspired by a book like Born to Run and then just go out and start barefoot running marathons if you're a marathon runner. It doesn't work like that. It takes years and years and years and different motor patterns um, to condition your tendons over, over a long period of time to adapt to a new movement pattern, particularly things that you do repetitively for long periods of time, like running or swimming or anything like that. So, um, Changes aren't fast; they're slow, and conditioning is something that you do over a, a long period of time. Which is not a—it's not a sexy thing to say. If you want to, yeah. if you want to sell products and you want to sell something, um, you say you know fast, easy results. Um, but the reality is a little bit different. Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, when that I listened to that book um, on as an audio book and got my vibrams, 
went yes. for a few runs, <laughs> yeah. got super tight calves and yeah. her, my shins were in pain for a while yep. and, uh, and didn't use them since. That's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's very very right. Guilty. <laughs> yeah. So and, very, uh, and a huge group also sued, uh, went in a class action against Byron. So, yeah, look, um, so the, you know, it's, so the, there's the, there's the inspiration, um, and then there's the real story. I mean, if you were mm. Tamar, Tamar, an Indian that, you know, grew up from a child, you know, running like that in the, in that sort of footwear and bare feet, um, that would be fine. But if you've grown up all of your, you know, all of your life in a moon boot, and then all of a sudden you want to, you want to do this, you know, different, completely different style, which puts completely different stresses on your body. Uh, it's it's not going to work overnight. It's going to take a long time to adapt. And the older you are, you know, the, the longer it takes um, mm. for those adaptations to to kick in. So that's why it's great to do this stuff with with little kids. Um, and you see, uh, you know, countries like New Zealand with um, with their small sided barefoot games, in you know, getting little kids to play small sided games of rugby and bare feet, and that, it's a big part of their culture, you know. And and look at what the All Blacks did over the last you know couple of decades. So. Um, yeah, there's there's different ways to go about it. Have you? I mean, I guess yeah. You're. Have what have you seen with the kids that you've worked with in terms of doing these strengthening exercises? Like, how long does it take to see results? Is it noticeable for for you or for the coaches over the course of a couple of months to to see their kick improving? Like, what's what, what have you seen? Yeah, we can only say anecdotally um, mm. that we've done it and you know, their kicking's getting better. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't automatically and necessarily transfer straight over the pool. And I haven't done a study on it um, with our own swimmers. Um, I've only done a study to say that, well, to look at whether if you're stronger and more flexible through there, uh, does that improve your underwater work? Um, and, you know, and it did. So uh, that's what, and that's what I was expecting. Um, and the outcome of that for me was to always include the foot exercises um, that we do in our, in our warm ups and exercise routines. Um, and just be, just be very aware of it and make sure that we're always doing that part of the training. And, and generally um, as a, as you know, Trent, as a, as a swimming club, we do, we do pretty well for a, for a country swimming club. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, um, and that's the Trilogan Swimming Club. As didn't mention that before, but that's where, um, yeah, where I I still compete for them, and uh, that's where I grew up swimming, and that's where um, my dad coaches as well. So, um, Sam, that's great. I think we'll leave it there for this part two episode on feet and ankles, and that's uh, for me, you know, working with a lot of um, adult swimmers and triathletes. That give, that's given me a lot of hope that there is ways to improve their range of motion through their feet because Absolutely. it's often a limiting factor in a big big way um, and I, like for me personally i focus a lot on the front end of the stroke the catch in the pool because if you're wearing a wetsuit look that's mostly what's going to make the biggest difference is that stuff but yes. certainly your feet can slow you down and we see that all the time so sam thanks very much and we'll be back for uh, part three where we're going to talk about deep core work and how you can develop your deep core strength and how that translates to swimming and um, better coordination through the rest of the body. So thank you, Sam. Thank you.